Well, once again, glad you're all here on this uh, first weekend of June. It's good to have you all here. It's not raining. We're grateful for that. Uh, we could use some more rain, don't you think? <laughs> uh, I'm going to start by a- answering a couple of questions that you may or may not be asking. First question, why are there two of us up here? Maybe you're wondering, isn't this the sermon time? What's, what's with the, the tag team? This is Laura Terrell. Some of you know Laura. Laura is director of Chapel Street Groups, uh, and if you don't know her by face, you, if you're in one of our groups, you receive her emails weekly where she writes the devotional material and the discussion questions that follow up our sermon series every week. Laura is a fantastic researcher, scholar, teacher. She is passionate about the Word of God, and she has a desire to communicate it as well. And the second reason she's with me is that Ruth, which we're finishing this morning, has a unique perspective because it's written both from the perspective of the narrator of Naomi and Ruth and of Boaz. Uh, So we have a male-female dual perspective thing going on. So we thought, what a great way to wrap up this series by having two perspectives in the sermon as we wrap up this unique book. Second question. Maybe you're asking yourself, why did we spend six weeks on this weird little story in the Old Testament? That's also a good question. And the biggest reason is that that story, while somewhat in the, you know, tucked away after the, you know, the book of Judges, is tells us the, uh, the grander story of God's redemptive work in the world. The characters in the story of Ruth are revealing to us the character of God. And God is zooming in and zooming out and showing us how he works in that time and how he works in our day as well. When we talked about this with Laura and Pastor Sterling and Gretchen and their tag teaming over at the Mill Creek campus, we talked about the idea of a mosaic. Some of you know what a mosaic is. You'll see a close up here of a particular mosaic. And I'm guessing you can't tell what that is very well from the angle looks like a bunch of you know, broken pieces of stone or glass. But when you zoom out, you get this picture here. And you see something beautiful, something miraculous really. And when you see the number of pieces and the care and placement, and in a way, that's what the book of Ruth is doing for us. Zooming in to show us broken pieces, Ruth and Naomi's life. And then zooming out to show us God's beautiful redemptive work across their lives and across the sweep of Old Testament history and our lives as well. So that's why uh, we're doing it this way and I'll let Laura take it from here. (laughs) Well, I thought we'd start with a recap of where we've been um, in the story of Ruth and it really centers around uh, two main characters, uh, Ruth and Naomi, and then Boaz comes in and later on in the story. But the story begins with Naomi and Elimelech. They are a married couple. They live in the town of Bethlehem, the little town of Bethlehem, you remember. Um, And they are part of the tribe of Judah. And they live in Bethlehem, but there's a problem in the land. There's no food, there's a famine. And at the time, Naomi felt like she had done everything right. She was a successful ancient Israelite woman in the sense that she'd married into a great family and she'd produced two sons. So she had this confidence um, that God had blessed their family, that they were doing well, but there's this problem of no food. And so her family makes the decision to move to Moab, which was a place known for its sin and its idolatry. Um, But they made this choice because they were trying to fix their problem of not having any food. And while they were there, the bottom sort of fell out of her life. Uh, Very early on, her husband passed away, and then after a few years, both of her sons passed away. So in a very short time in chapter one, Naomi goes from being very full to very empty. And at the end of chapter one, she's left alone except for one person, and that's this foreign daughter-in-law named Ruth, the Moabite. And around that time, Naomi heard that there was food once again. God had come to the aid of his people, and there was food back again in Bethlehem, so she makes the choice to go back home. She didn't know it yet, um, but God was working behind the the scenes to restore Naomi. It didn't feel like that. In that moment, it still felt like a crisis, but God was working behind the scenes and would be faithful through the obedience of Ruth and Boaz to restore Naomi. And last week, we ended with the story of how Boaz chose to redeem Naomi's land and her family line by marrying Ruth. It was sort of a surprise. And we ended with this extravagant blessing of the town elders on the day of Boaz and Ruth's marriage. And there's a few things that come out in that blessing that um, they wish upon them. And they say, may God make Ruth like Rachel and Leah who together built up the family of Israel. 
quite literally. They built the nation of Israel by having 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. So this blessing is surprising in that they're saying, may this Moabite woman be like Rachel and Leah who founded the nation of Israel. So it's an interesting thing that they're praying for them. And they said, may you have honor in your clan and in your town and may your legacy be like that of Perez who was a child born to a non-Israelite mother. And what's interesting about that is they're all from the clan of Judah. And when they mention Perez, they're uh, referencing their own origin story, which was that of a non-Israelite mother giving birth to a son that continued the family line. And they're saying, may Ruth be like that same family. They're saying, what God did before, may he do here again, this unexpected thing. So let's go ahead and pick up our story in Ruth chapter four, verses 13 through 17. It says, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he went to her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. The first thing I want you to see in what Laura just read there as she kind of recapped that for us is the birth of a son. Now that might sound like a simple thing, but it's, there's so much wrapped up in the birth of this son, Obed. And this is a theme throughout the Bible that we have Abram and Sarah wanting to have a son and the son of the promise born to Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, and Isaac's son, Jacob, and Esau, and then the 12 tribes, as Laura mentioned. So the birth of a son's a big deal, and it is here as well. In a way, Ruth's story and Naomi's story is one of brokenness, one painful setback after another. And then in verse 13, it's summed up so succinctly, almost like it comes full circle. He marries her, he's with her, she becomes pregnant, and they have a son. The whole thing has come full circle. You you have to think back to chapter one. How did chapter one end? Ruth says, don't call me, or Naomi says, don't call me Naomi. That means blessed or pleasant. Call me Mara, that means bitter. She's gone from bitterness to blessing. She's, she's, her, her, her life has been transformed and it's bound up in the personification of this little boy, this baby boy, Obed. Now, there's only two places in the whole book of Ruth where the narrator tells us specifically God's doing something directly. In chapter one, verse six, when Ruth hears that God has come back to his people and is, the famine is over, he has again re- come back to his people and she decides to go back to Bethlehem. And the second place is verse 13. It's easy to miss, but it says that God gave her conception, enabled her to conceive, your Bible might say. Now, every baby is a gift from God. We know that every life is a gift from God. At the moment of conception, it's a gift. But here the author wants to make sure we understand that God did this. Hmm. Yahweh did this. You didn't deserve this, you didn't make this happen, God did it. Now don't forget, Ruth has been without a child for 10 years, childless, and now, miraculously, she's given birth to this son, this baby boy, Obed. And I think sometimes in my life, and maybe in your life too, we pray for things, we long for things, and then God gives them to us, but maybe not in our time, or in our way that we assumed, and we forget. He did that. When, I, when our kids were young, my wife used to have this thing called a victory candle, a little candle, a little book. And every time we saw God answer a family prayer, do something in our lives, we would light that candle and write it down in a little book. And we had like this little record of God's faithfulness just to remind ourselves, God did that. God did that. And that's exactly what the author is saying to us here, that Ruth is part of a bigger story. And God is not done redeeming. All of the brokenness and pain now, we're seeing that it fits in. Remember that mosaic picture? Sometimes your life can feel like broken pieces. I don't know where I fit. I don't see what God's doing. I don't understand this. Ruth is showing us, the story of Ruth is showing us that God's doing something big. And so two things we want you to be aware of and remember throughout this this morning's sermon, and that's number one, you're part of a bigger story. I want everybody to say with me right now when I tell you, say, I'm part of a greater story. Ready? I'm I'm part part of of a greater greater story. story. 
it's easy to forget that, but you are part of a greater story. Number two, God is not done redeeming. Ready? God, God is, is not, not done, done redeeming. redeeming. If you leave here with nothing else, leave here with that. You're part of a greater story, and God is not done redeeming. Uh, because God is doing something remarkable that you don't always see in the everyday, sometimes painful, sometimes confusing events of your life. But you are part of a bigger story, and God is not done redeeming. Which brings us to point two, which is the redemption of a family. Um, Naomi's emptiness has been replaced by fullness. Remember that she started out with a husband and two sons and she had this sense of completeness or fullness. And she probably dreamed one day of being surrounded by grandchildren and hosting big family dinners in the backyard or whatever. Um, But that had stopped. Um, That whole dream, that whole plan had sort of gone sideways. But now in chapter four, we see an element that's being returned to her um, as she is being given this new baby to care for. Naomi was part of a bigger story and God was not done redeeming her yet. She has a redeemer and it's this baby that's been born to Ruth and Boaz. And that might kind of come as a surprise. How exactly is a baby going to be a redeemer for grandma Naomi? And we'll get to that in a minute. But for now, I want you to imagine this scene when Naomi is standing there holding this baby and the women of the town are surrounding her and they're celebrating with her. They're ooing and aahing over the little baby toes and the little baby fingers. (laughs) And they're celebrating this new baby because they know what she's lost but they also are able to celebrate with her what God is doing, this new thing that he's doing in her life. Mm -hmm. And she's seeing the promise once again of new life. You know, uh, even if you're not um, a mother, or or, all guys, you're not mothers, Um, (laughs) but even if you've never had that experience, all of you know what it's like when somebody brings a newborn baby, right? And the family gets around, they all stick their faces in the car seat. Can you imagine, I wonder if kids are cognitive, what they think about, like, why are all these people poking me and making weird (laughs) faces at me? some of you, when my son Noah was born, he's 22 now and he's 220 pounds, but when he was a baby, he was four pounds, six ounces. He looked like he was in a skin sack that was four sizes too big for him. He was kind of an ugly baby. I mean, most people think their babies are cute and he's handsome now, but he was a bit of an ugly kid when he was born. Anyway, um, recently, some of you will know, some of you will know, um, uh, he's not here so I can say that. Some, some of you know um, uh, Allie Goble, who used to be one of our worship leaders here, and now it's over at our Mill Creek campus. Allie and her husband, Jonathan, prayed for years that they could get pregnant and, and, and wasn't, weren't able to. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of pain in that, and some of you know that pain. And then they thought about adoption and prayed about that and entered into that process of thinking about the expense and the process and how that mm-hmm. would go. And, and some of you have been a part of that journey with them. And then God blessed them, and they were able to adopt baby Jaden Christopher. Look at that. Come on. <laughs> Jaden Christopher Goble. And I remember we were praying for them and hearing about it. When, they, when, when Allie came to the church office with baby Jaden for the first time, it was exactly the scene in Ruth. All the office women, well, me too, the men too, <laughs> jammed around. Oh, look, we were poking him and cooing and ooing at him, you know. And, and not just because he's cute, which he's cute, obviously, <laughs> but because we knew the pain. Mm. We knew what Allie and Jonathan went through. We knew the longing. Mm. And some of you are in that place right now of waiting and wondering, where are you, God? You feel like broken pieces. You don't know where you fit. Mm. You're part of a bigger story, and God is not done redeeming. doesn't mean every sad thing gets undone in this life, but it does mean God's writing a greater story than we often see or believe, and he's never done redeeming. We all have our own stories of heartache and waiting. And for me, it came years ago. Um, My husband and I had been married for a few years and we were hoping to have a child. And we found out I was pregnant. We were so excited. And I made it to week 13 and you kind of feel like you've turned the corner and you're safe now. Um, But it was around that time that I ended up having a miscarriage. And I had to spend the night in the hospital. My body was in fairly rough shape and they didn't really know where to put me. So they ended up putting me on the maternity ward, um, which meant that throughout the night I was hearing the cries of little newborn babies. Mm. And it was in that moment, my husband and I are just sitting in that hospital room, looking at each other, asking each other, where is God in this moment? What are we supposed to do? Um, And I think the question of how long are we going to be in this and what is God doing? Um, And at the same time, we were part of a church where the pastor would regularly stand up front and say these words, God is good. And the congregation would answer all All the time. time. And he would say all the time, God is good. And I I remember sitting in that hospital room wondering, could I still say that? Hmm. 
Was that still true? And I would say it took several weeks um, that led into months before I could say that with confidence again. God had me on a journey. And sometimes when we're in that moment, it's hard to believe um, that God is still writing our story and that he's still in the work of redemption. And I imagine as Naomi held that newborn baby at the end of chapter four, she had that sense of both joy and a little bit of pain as she remembered what it was that she had lost. Um, it's It's not that her past was erased, but instead God was in the process of redeeming it and doing a new thing. And he was in the process of restoring things and changing her life. I have a picture here of my daughter, Haley, This is a few hours after she was born. She's 13 now, so she's a lot bigger. Uh, But this is when she was brand new, and those are both of her grandmas looking over her, my husband in the background. He's wearing hospital scrubs where they put the little footprints on them. Um, But this, for me, was a moment that felt very much like that, that God was doing a new thing, and we were able to celebrate that new thing um, because God was still writing our story. We didn't always know it at the time. When Naomi was going through this, Um, The women in chapter four are surrounding her because they know almost better than anybody else that God was doing something new and that God was in the process of writing Naomi's story and he was doing amazing things through it. And it reminds us that God has not left us without a redeemer. Let's finish up this idea of redemption of a family for a minute. Um, In verse 15, let me read it for you again. Uh, The women now are speaking about the blessing of this baby. And they say in verse 15, something that's it's easy to miss, but there's a lot packed in these words. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is more to you than seven sons that has given birth to him. First of all, more than seven sons. I mean, that is a, seven's the number of perfection in the Bible and completion. And so when, the, when they say, may your, your daughter-in-law, Moabite daughter-in-law, be, is better to you than seven sons, that's a radical thing to say because of what God has done. Uh, and then they say, may your son, your baby, this baby, your grandson actually, be to you a restorer of life. I don't know what you think about you when you hear that phrase, restored life. It's easy for us to think about like restoration projects, you know, that God comes in and he's going to do a little restoration project. He's going to do a remodeling. He's going to give me a better life. He's going to help me uh, improve my life. He's going to give me my best life now. That's not what it means at all. It means, remember where Naomi was, death bitterness, despair, now life and hope. It, the gospel is God doesn't come and improve your life or give you a little bit better life or help you with your life or coach you in your life. He, he brings you from death to life. He restores you to life. Here's how the apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Not mostly dead like in the princess bride, but all dead, all the way dead in your trespasses and sins. And then God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. That's the gospel. Restores your life. You were dead. Dead. And he's brought you to life. And and this ancient story of Ruth is pointing us to this gospel truth. Remember, zooming in, showing us this little story, this one Israelite family from Bethlehem, the time of Judges, and then zooming out to show us something amazing that God is still doing because you're part of a bigger story. And God is not done redeeming. Now, at the end of the story, Ruth and Boaz, who are kind of central here, fade into the background, and it's all about the baby, all the hope. Laura or mentioned this a moment ago. How can this baby be Naomi's redeemer? It's a lot of pressure to put on a kid, you know, that you're going to be the hope of the whole family. And sometimes we've done that. I know when my oldest was born, I have all grown cousins and two sisters. And my, when my grandfather, who very, was very Scottish, was very concerned that we would have a Fraser to carry on the clan name, when, when Noah was born, the pressure was off, you know. But... <laughs> Here, what does it mean that, that this baby, Obed, is the hope of this family, is the redeemer? Remember, first, Boaz was the kinsman redeemer because he allowed Ruth to glean in her field. And he, bought, he married her and bought and ransomed, redeemed the family. And now they're saying, Obed, his son is the kinsman, is the redeemer. And what it's telling us is that these are temporary redeemers pointing us to an ultimate redeemer who is to come. Now, if this is where the story ended, how many of you like Hallmark movies? <laughs> I sort of don't, but, it, <laughs> but, 
But if this movie, if the story ended here, right? If it just ended here, like the, all the people looking at baby Obed, oh, isn't this nice? The, the Christmas music starts to play, the snow starts to fall, and it fades to black. What a nice story, you know? <laughs> it would be a good story, but it doesn't end there, does it, Laura? No, it doesn't. It says that Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse, and the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And when we hear those last few words, we might think, well, that's just a bunch of names. That's not really telling us anything. But to the first hearers of this story, that would have been the equivalent of like a giant bomb being dropped. You know, this idea that this tiny little baby was in the family, the royal family line. He was going to be the grandfather of King David. That would have made an impact when they first heard it. But for Naomi, she has been given this new baby. And it's, I was kind of joking earlier that they say that it's Naomi's son. That's what the women of the town say, but it's actually Ruth's baby. Um, but Naomi is the one that's going to be caring for her and it's her redeemer. That's the role that this baby is playing in her life. But the exciting thing is that she has a personal relationship with this redeemer, that she's going to be actively involved. She's gonna be a very active grandma helping to raise this baby. And she's going to play a role in raising this child. And the women that are rejoicing with her are the same women that back in chapter one, when Naomi returned to Bethlehem after many years of hardship in Moab, when she returned just as a, you know, as a single person with this foreign daughter-in-law, they were so confused because they remembered who she was when she was left, when she left Bethlehem to go to Moab. She was this proud wife and mother, and now she returned um, by herself, and they were saying, could this even be Naomi? Uh, they were so struck by the difference, and here they're seeing her restored, and it's these same women that are rejoicing with her because they know that Naomi has not been left without a redeemer. Um, this baby, Obed, has an incredibly important role to play in the history of Israel. He's not only the redeemer of Naomi and her family, he's going to lead to King David, who will be the redeemer of the nation of Israel. This is the line of the king. The last thing I want you to see here, it's really important. We go from the birth of a son to the redemption of a family to the line of a king. Uh, now, if this would be way better than a Hallmark movie if it ended with King David. Am I on? Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Good. Okay, good. Uh, so if it just ends with Obed, that's sweet. That's nice. We all feel good. Nice sigh. Let's go out let's leave the theater. But it doesn't end there. It ends with King David, Israel's greatest king. I mean, who sees this coming? That this Moabite widow would be redeemed by Boaz, allowed to glean her to field, he would marry her, they would have a son, and that would be the grandfather of Israel's greatest king, the greatest king in the Old Testament story of God's people. But it doesn't end there either. Let me read to you verses 18 through 22, the end of the chapter. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron, and Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed, and Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. So this actually reminds me of uh, the Marvel movies. My family's gotten really into these the last few months. In fact, we made the decision, I don't know that this was very smart of us, but we decided we would watch them in order. There's like 22 movies. That's a serious time commitment. But we were starting to watch them because we were preparing for Endgame. But one of the things we noticed pretty quickly on was that um, when the final scene plays and you're caught up in the movie and then it fades to black and the credits start to roll, normally that's when you turn the movie off. But we realized that there was always a hidden scene in the credits. Sometimes there's more than one. And if you stuck around long enough to watch them, there was always a little hint or a teaser of what was going to happen next in the bigger story. And that's, I, I was joking with Jeff that I made him read all the hard names, but that's why those hard names are in the Bible, right? We see them and we think that's just a lot of names, but there's actually hints in there of this bigger story that's, that's going to come. And in fact, this story is incredible because it leads us all the way to Jesus. What? And I know, it's crazy. You're kidding, Jesus? Jesus. In 
Matthew 1, we have another genealogy, and this is the genealogy of Jesus, and it traces his family line starting in Abraham and goes all the way through. And tucked in there in those lists of names, there's actually four women who were named, um, including Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. And Bathsheba, her name isn't actually there, it's her, she's mentioned by her relationship, but she's listed in there too. And you might be asking yourself, what in the world are those women doing in the line of Christ? Why are their names there? And most of those women were outsiders to begin with. They were non-Israelite women, and several of them had stories that were frankly pretty sketchy. So what are they doing there in the line of Christ? And when you think about it, they're there for the same reason we are. We're included in the line of Christ because we're part of his family, and that's all because of God's grace. That's right. That's, right. that's really, I hope you hear that. These, these women who have, as Laura said, some sketchy backgrounds, and the men too, let's, not, let's be fair. <laughs> not there because they're spiritual giants. Sometimes you read the Old Testament and you think, well, these people are beyond me. They're not. They're people redeemed by God's grace, included the same way we are, because God is a gracious God, not because we deserve it, because he takes broken pieces, puts them together, because you're part of a greater story, and God is not done redeeming. He's still putting the pieces together as he was then. That's so important for us to, me- to remember. So Matthew now, uh, and as Laura mentioned, his genealogy lists the same names, and he sort of zooms out to show us how this ancient love story called Ruth in the time of Judges, a very dark and desperate time in Israel's history, how it connects to the great grand story that doesn't just lead to the, Israel's greatest king, but leads to the king of kings, to Jesus himself. This is, I mean, who sees this coming? Only God, because you're part of a greater story. And God is not done redeeming. And this means that Jesus is your kinsman redeemer. Remember Boaz, right? He has the right, uh, he has the right because of his family position to redeem. He has the resources, the wealth to do it, and he desires to do it. That's a picture of Jesus. He has the right. He's like us, tested in every way like we are, yet without sin. He has the resources. All authority in heaven and earth belongs to him. And he absolutely has the will. Philippians 2 tells us that he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Why? To redeem, to seek and to save those who are lost. This is all pointing us to the one who is to come, our kinsman redeemer, your redeemer and mine if you're in Christ. And what this means is that if you're in Christ and you know Jesus as your redeemer, it means that your past sin and the past sins of other people that have deeply impacted your life, your mistakes, your failures, the brokenness of your family, none of it can cancel out your future hope. Do you hear that? If you know Jesus as your redeemer, it means your past sin, your past failures, and the past pain of your life cannot cancel out future hope. It also means that the same God who was at work in the life of Naomi and Ruth and Boaz, even when things looked really dark, the same God who is at work in that story is also in the wor- as at work in our own stories. And it's hard for us to know. I, I think sometimes we read these stories and we think, oh, they had it easy, like things made sense. That's because we're reading the story and we get to see the whole thing. When they were living it moment by moment, they didn't know how the story was going to end. And that's the same thing that's true for for us. Mm-hmm. As we're living our lives, there are moments of darkness and, and pain, um, but we don't have God's perspective. We don't see the whole story. But at the end of our lives, we're able to look back and reflect and see the ways that God was at work even when we didn't know it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just a good reminder for us when things get difficult to still be able to say that God is good mm-hmm. all the time. Mm-hmm. That's good. The same God, I think it's easy to forget that. Sometimes I've gone on missions trips with students and I'll we'll experience God like a mountaintop experience when I was a youth pastor. You come back and you feel like, well, that was there. This is different. It isn't different. Sometimes you can read the stories in the Bible and think, well, that's, you know, that's Bible times. It's the same God, friends. We worship the same God and he's still at work because you're part of a greater story and he's not done redeeming. And this means that you can trust him even in the worst times, even in the darkest times, even when you feel like a broken piece that doesn't fit. You can trust that the story's not over. And it's a much bigger story than you possibly can see in that moment. And God is still redeeming. I want to finish by telling you a story that fits in a larger story of my Uncle Jerry. You'll see an image of Uncle Jerry here. That's my Uncle Jerry and his dog Killer on the back of his horse. Killer would always ride back on the back of the saddle. <laughs> it's my mom's older brother. And he was like a hero to me when I was a kid. Uh, he was a real cowboy. He lived in Montana most of his life, and I wanted to be just like Uncle Jerry. Uh, and he was kind of a rough guy, a little tough. He wasn't exactly uh, emotionally, uh, you know, he didn't share his feelings very often, but I just admired him and thought he was cool. 
But as I got older and I became a Christ follower, I realized one thing about my Uncle Jerry that, that was hard was he didn't, he didn't believe in God. He wasn't a follower of Jesus. And I struggled with that. I prayed for him often. And he would say things, not, not to me, but to my mom, and I heard about it, that, you know, like uh, religion is for weak people. Or I'd be a coward to accept Jesus now after the way I've lived my life. He lived a pretty hard life. And, and, and then, um, you know, he, I would pray for him, but I all sort of, I guess maybe you like this. I, did, I, I feel almost guilty admitting this. I hadn't given up on him, but I sort of thought, well, you know, Jerry's made his choice. God can do anything, but he's, he's a pretty hard case. Last few months of his life, recently, he's in, in a convalescent home. He's got emphysema and all, all kinds of issues and, from his lifestyle choices and is dying. And his, his older sister, my Aunt Julie, went to visit him almost daily or weekly for sure and would share the gospel with him and pray for him and talk to him about Jesus. And he said to her, listen, if you're going to keep bringing up Jesus when you come here, stop coming to see me. Just keep, I don't want it. And then my mom called me a few months ago and could hardly get the words out and said, Uncle Jerry became a Christian. Uncle Jerry prayed to receive Christ. Silence on the phone. I'm going to see my sister Jill. I know she got the same call. <laughs> And what? Tell me the story. Well, unbeknownst to any of us, he's meeting with this man who, had, who was a friend of the family who had come by and share Christ and befriend him and talk to him. And little by little, God used that man to break down the walls in Uncle Jerry's heart. And he said, I never believed I could be forgiven. I wanted to be, but I thought after all the stuff I've done, I never thought I could be. That's why I kept it at arm's length. And you know, six weeks later, he passed away. And I'll see him again. But you know what those six weeks were filled with? Wanting to see all his friends and telling them with his weak, gruff voice, where are you with God? You know, it's important. Jolene, tell them about Jesus. You know, <laughs> you know, like, he wanted to share. That story illustrates perfectly the heart of what I want you to leave with, what we want you to leave with. You're part of a much bigger story. Nobody is ever outside the reach of God. The story's not over. And God is still redeeming, even in the last hours. He's still at work. And we're going to celebrate by coming to our Redeemer's table and close this service with communion. It's a perfect illustration because what we do through bread and cup is not just remember, although we do remember. We enact the story, the great story we're a part of, God's redeeming love. And so now I want you to know something. If you're here as a guest or a visitor or new to our church, it does not matter to us if you're a member, a regular, tender or not. If you know Jesus as your redeemer, if you trusted in him for the forgiveness of your sin, then you are welcome at the king and redeemer's table. In a moment after I prayed, ushers will pass the trays and you'll find two cups stacked together. Bread on the bottom, cup on top. Just hold them both in your hands until we've all been served. And after that, I'll come back up and lead us through the elements. Let's bow together as the ushers come. Lord Jesus, our king and our redeemer, we often forget this and lose sight of it. Sometimes we feel like lost and broken pieces. But you are writing a greater story, and we praise you that we're a part of that. We thank you for your grace, which we don't deserve and which we cannot earn, and yet you, our Redeemer, pour out your grace in our lives. Prepare our hearts now as we come to your table to remember the greatness of your love. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus, our King and our Redeemer. Amen.